This week on the Green Left News podcast, six months of genocide and resistance, the campaign for abortion rights in the US, and Israel launches strikes on Iran. This podcast was recorded on stolen land. Green Left is committed to supporting struggles for First Nation justice. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Isaac Nellist and I'm excited to bring you the latest news for this week. I'm also excited to introduce a new guest host, uh, Riley Breen from Borloo, Perth. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Isaac. I'm really excited to be here too. And just for the listeners at home, could you tell us a bit about yourself, what kind of campaigns you're involved in, stuff like that? Uh, yeah, so I'm a member of Socialist Alliance WA. I'm also uh, I'm an active member of Unions for Palestine WA with a, a strong focus at the moment on Palestinian solidarity, but I've been involved in a number of campaigns over the last couple of years. Awesome, and it's very exciting to have you uh, on the podcast with me today, and hopefully we'll be able to do a few more of these in the next few few weeks, few months. Um, but we'll kick it off with the news of the Palestine uh, solidarity movement with thousands taking to the streets on the 27th week of consecutive protests across April 13 and 14, demanding that the Australian government stop supporting Israel politically, economically, and militarily. So Israel's genocide in Gaza, as we said at the start, has been going for more than six months, with more than 30,000 Palestinians killed, and more than half of these children. Protests took place on the same day as Iran launched a retaliatory strike in response to Israel's attack on Iran's Damascus embassy, reminding the world of the high stakes surrounding Israel's genocidal warmongering. The rallies also took place after Israel had murdered six international aid workers and their Palestinian driver in a series of attacks on the World Central Kitchen aid convoy, killing Australian aid worker Lalzawami Zomi Frankom and sparking outrage across the country, including forcing Prime Minister Anthony Albanese and Foreign Minister Penny Wong to offer some superficial criticism of Benjamin Netanyahu. But it's also giving pause to ask why some lives seem to matter more than others, with more outrage over one Australian aid worker than the 30,000 Palestinians that have been killed. And despite the Labour government's empty phrase-mongering, they've not made any concrete moves to sanction Israel. And so following the weekend rallies, there was actions on the 15th of April for the A15 International Day of Action, which aimed to cause economic disruption to force uh, action against Israel. Now, Riley, you were involved in organising one of these actions over in uh, Borloo, Perth. Can you tell us a bit more about the uh, A15 International Day of Action and the rally you organised as well? Yeah, so um, the A15 was a initiative started in uh, the United States, which has since spread out through uh, internationally as a um, an international call to action for people to escalate their their actions from symbolic protests to more economically disruptive protests. Um, there were 69 cities or more around the world who participated, with 19 of the actions happening in Australia, at least one in every capital city of Australia. 23 people were arrested around the country, targeting Talas, Elbit Systems, Korowang Engineering, and universities with ties to, to weapons companies, as well as uh, MSC, Mediterranean Shipping Company, here in uh, Fremantle and Bulu. Internationally, there were nine port actions, three airports targeted, 20 factories, and many, many highways blockaded, with 480 or more arrests happening around the world. And yes, so as I mentioned before, you were uh, involved in organising one of these A15 actions in uh, Fremantle uh, and you were targeting the Mediterranean Shipping Company. Can you tell us why that was the target of the the, uh, blockade? Here in uh, Fremantle, 
as part of uh, Bulu. And Union for Palestine organised a disruption of the offices of Mediterranean Shipping Company. Mediterranean Shipping Company, uh, as an international organisation, also has very close links with Israel. They're a Switzerland-based company. In particular, here in WA and in the rest of Australia, they've been one of the main contractors for the Zim vessels that have been targeted as part of boycott, divestment and sanctions and uh, port actions around Australia. So uh, we're calling on Mediterranean Shipping Company to cut ties with Israel. Our demands being there's no business with genocide. Yeah, it looked like a great rally and people can read a report about it at greenleft.org.au. Um, another A15 action was the blockade of the Ferra Engineering Factory in Maganjan or Brisbane. Now, Ferra produces more than 100 parts for the F-35 fighter jets that are being used to bomb Gaza, including they build the mechanism that allows bombs to be dropped from planes. And shamefully, Ferra receives a lot of support from state and federal governments for its production of these weapons. And shut down Ferra activist Abby Hayden Palestine. spoke to Green Free, free Palestine! Free, free Palestine! From the river to the sea! Palestine will be free! From the river to the sea! Palestine will be free! So we're here today to uh, disrupt Israel's war machine. Um, Ferra make over 100 parts for the F-35 fighter jets, which the Dutch court have confirmed Israel have been using to bomb Gaza, and they are the sole supplier of some of these parts. Activists have been picketing the factory every few weeks and held an action at Queensland Parliament to call out the government's support for the company. Outside of A15... Other actions that took place over the last few weeks include vigils in Gamoy or Cairns, uh, Borlu, Perth, uh, Karatha and the Gold Coast, as well as protests in Broadmeadows and outside Labor Senator Jess Walsh's office, as well as speakouts in McGanjin, Brisbane and Corneyota, Adelaide, as well as countless other actions. And we have Green Left reporters at as many of these actions as we can get to who write the reports that uh, we're giving today all the ones you can read at our website as well as taking photos and videos uh, and to mark the six months of uh, resistance to Israel's genocide we released the entire recording of the recent rally in Maganjan, Brisbane on April 7 which includes speeches from Jamal Nabulsi, Samir El Agada, Nora from Doctors for Palestine and Greens MP Max Chan Lametha. You can listen to the recording right here on the podcast feed. It was honestly um, a shock for me to realise that it, um, it, this genocide has been ongoing for six months. Uh, on one hand, I'm shocked that Israel's been able to commit a genocide of this scale and for so long uh, with not only international impunity but uh, very active support, uh, including from Australia. Hey. On the other hand... Uh, I just can't believe that six months has, has passed. Um, like October feels like it was last week. In the Blue Mountains, the combined push of regular rallies organised by Mountains for Palestine and an action from other local councils led to Greens councillors submitting a motion for Palestine. It called on the Australian government to uphold international law, work to stop Israel's genocide, stop UNRWA funding and work to end Israel's siege on Gaza. Blue Mountain's Labor refused to cooperate with the motion, instead creating its own weaker motion. Community pressure meant that both motions were passed by all but one councillor at this council's February meeting. And a New South Wales counterterrorism team accosted an artist after he criticised the lenient treatment given to Zionists who planted a bomb on a Palestinian activist's ute. It took... Pl- uh, It took police eight weeks to find the culprit, David Weiss, who was eventually arrested and has been held on remand since March. After Shane Chester spoke up publicly about what he believed were inadequate charges, police took his laptop, PC and phone away for five days. Chester told Green Left that police pinned him against a wall and body searched him while he was fasting for Ramadan. Chester was not arrested or charged, but was told that an investigation is still underway. The Jewish Council of Australia and the Ahmadiyya Muslim Community of Australia 
are among many faithful organizations that have condemned efforts to weaponize the tragic stabbings that took place at a shopping center in Bondi on April 13. Joel Couchy killed six people and injured at least 12 before being shot dead by a New South Wales police officer. Before the attacker was identified, false information spread by anti-Semitic accounts on social media that the attacker's name was Benjamin Cohen. At the same time, right-wing Islamophobic groups claimed it was an Islamic extremist attack, with some even linking it to the Palestinian Solidarity Movement. JCA, Jewish Council of Australia spokesperson, Dr. Max Kaiser said, we unequivocally condemn any attempts to stoke fear, hatred or discrimination against migrants, Muslims or Jews in the aftermath of this horrific event. Days later, a bishop and priest were stabbed at an Orthodox Christian church in Western Sydney. A new film by Environment Action Group Rising Tide was launched by an enthusiastic crowd on April 4. The first wave tells the story of the historic people's blockade of the world's largest coal port in Mullabimba or Newcastle last November, when more than 2,000 people blockaded the entrance to Newcastle's harbour with kayaks and rafts and joined what was dubbed a protestable with live music, workshops and family activities. The blockade stopped coal ships for 48 hours before police arrested more than 100 people. And the film includes short interviews with participants who explained why they became involved and their hopes for a fossil-free future. After the film screening, a panel discussed how to further build the climate movement. And you can find upcoming screenings of the film or get involved in building the 2024 People's Blockade which is set to go for 10 days and mobilise 10,000 people by going to risingtide.org.au. Social work students are struggling to complete the required 1,000 hours of unpaid placement work to get their degree and want to end the unpaid scheme. They're being supported by the Australian Services Union to pressure the federal government to provide funding. The union said the system forces students into a corner, choosing between their education and their livelihood. It said it was contributing to a dropout rate where more than 20% of community service degree students leave their studies due to financial stress. A rally in Gadigal, Sydney on April 12th marked the beginning of a national week of action to raise awareness of the dire circumstances facing these students in a cost of living crisis. Sign the petition to end unpaid placements at the link in the podcast description. Any renters listening will already know the huge costs of rents at the moment, which hit record prices in March. You'll also be aware of the very poor quality of a lot of rental homes, particularly when it comes to keeping the heat out in summer. Uh, And a new report from Better Renting has found that rental housing is failing to perform one of its most basic functions, which is providing shelter from the elements. The report found that renters are stuck in homes that are reaching temperatures of up to 45 degrees and that for roughly 50% of the time, Rental homes across the country were above the comfortable limit of 18 to 24 degrees, with averages of over 28 degrees in some states. In some states as well, such as Queensland, it was hotter inside the house than out most of the time, and renters couldn't do anything about it with low vacancy rates and and high rental prices, many reported being afraid to ask for upgrades, fearing evictions and homelessness. In response, a collective of housing and anti-poverty groups called on Labor to retrofit all public and social housing with climate upgrades by 2030, as well as strengthening protections for private renters and people on welfare payments. A coalition of grassroots housing groups launched a national petition campaign on April 1st, which aims to involve unions in defending and extending public housing. The Fix the Housing Crisis petition calls on unions in construction, electrical, plumbing and the public sector to support community-led green bans, as well as to refuse to demolish public housing and defend public housing tenants against evictions. Spokesperson Rachel Evans said skyrocketing rents were the context for a massive increase in homelessness. She said, instead of building the public housing, Labor wants to demolish public housing estates. Historically, unions have stopped anti-social developments and played a critical role in pushing governments to commit to public works through enacting community-led green bans. A green ban is a prohibition prohibition of work by union members on demolishing important social, environmental and heritage sites. You can sign the petition in the podcast description. 
More than 200 people rallied on April 2 to demand Labor close the notorious Unit 18 of Western Australia's Banksia Hill Detention Centre. And the protest was organised by family and supporters of 16-year-old First Nations teenager Cleveland Dodd, who died in the controversial Unit 18 youth detention wing last year. His is the first recorded death of a black teenager in a WA prison. The rally marched through the CBD to David Malcolm Justice Centre the day before the coronial inquest into Dodd's death began. Now, the inquest was told that Dodd was held in the adult section of the maximum security prison, despite not being convicted of any crime. And on the night he died, he had threatened to kill himself eight times, but was ignored by the correctional services workers. More hearings are scheduled for later in the year. One of the staunch First Nations activists who has been leading the push to end death in custody, including exposing the cruel treatment of children at Bankshire Hill, is Manang woman of the Noongar Nation, Megan Cracker. She has been central to the recent Invasion Day protests and is a director of the National Suicide Prevention and Trauma Recovery Project and the Southwest Aboriginal Land and Sea Council. We're very excited to announce that Cracker will be speaking at the Eco-Socialism 2024 conference in Bulu, Perth from June 28th to 30th. Other new speaker announcements include, include Clifton de Rosario, a leader of the Communist Party of India Marxist-Leninist Liberation, who was a highlight of last year's conference. De Rosario will be addressing the fight to save India's democracy from President Narendra Modi's autocratic right-wing Hindu, Hindi chauvinism. We are also really lucky to be joined by Nasser Mashni, who is the president of Australia Palestine Advocacy Network and has been a central figure in the Palestinian solidarity movement for a very long time as well as Zach Schofield, an organiser with Rising Tide. Yeah, really exciting announcements. And those uh, new speakers will be joining Palestinian revolutionary Leila Khaled, South African human rights activist Salim Bali, and Pakistani socialist Amar Ali Jan, as well as many more. But it's going to be a really incredible conference. Um, you can find out more about Eco-Socialism 2024, including the full agenda and the speaker list, as well as booking your tickets at ecosocialism.org.au. There was a flicker of hope for Julian Assange and his supporters when US President Joe Biden made a casual remark that he was considering the request by Australia to conclude the case. Assange has already spent five years in Belmarsh Prison in London, but Biden has not yet dropped the 18 charges, 17 of which are based on the US Espionage Act of 1917. Last month, the British High Court made a ruling that Assange would not be extradited to the US unless he was guaranteed First Amendment rights, guaranteed not to be prejudiced against, and not to be subject to the death penalty. But these assurances cannot be relied on, and Assange supporters have pointed out many ways that the US legal system can get around them. For now, we await the next hearing on May 20 as Assange remains locked up for blowing the whistle on US war crimes. Stop August WA organised a protest outside the West Australian Defence Forum on March 19. Attendees were met with chants of money for housing, not for war, and no nuclear subs, stop August now. Stop August WA spokesperson Elizabeth Holm said the forum's agenda perpetuates the fallacy that arming for war acts as a deterrence, that housing and home porting nuclear powered submarines at HMAS Stirling, just over six kilometres of Rockingham, which is where the event was held, will protect us. Sam Wainwright, another Stop AUKUS WA spokesperson, told the protest that AUKUS won't make us safer. And a school principal, trade union leader and co-founder of the Peasant Association of Workers of Argelia, Huemo and Andreas Mosquera Miranda, is seeking political asylum in Australia after miraculously surviving two assassination attempts. Now, Colombia is one of the most dangerous countries to be a trade unionist, and between 2018 to 2023 alone, uh, more than 3,300 trade unionists were murdered. So one of the assassination attempts against Mosquera was caught on camera, with the assassin trying to shoot him in the back of the head at close range uh, and the gun jamming. Members of the Latin American community in Australia are raising money to help pay 
for mascaras, uh, relocation costs, translation fees, and legal expenses. And they've started a GoFundMe for Mascara and his family. And you can donate to the GoFundMe at the link in the podcast description. Green Left is still banned from Facebook for posting interviews with Palestinian revolutionary Leila Khalid. New South Wales Greens MP Jenny Leong said on social media that banning Green Left from a platform which the people-powered activist media outlet has used for years to disseminate critical information, build movements and expose injustice and inequity and taken a staunchly anti-capitalist stance is a disgrace. Leong said that Greens Left's Facebook ban is connected to a campaign of political censorship that includes the blocking of Al Jazeera broadcasting in Israel, the ABC's sacking of Antoine Latouf, and the mainstream media's failure to report on the countless Palestine actions around the country. I also just heard that Meta has shut down School Strike for Climate's Queensland Facebook page for posting about West Papua. So we have all solidarity to the school strikers. To get around this censorship and to help keep our project going, please come become a supporter and get Green Left delivered to you. It's $5 a month for a digital subscription. And for $10 a month, you can actually get the paper delivered to your home, which I think is, is really great. You get to take it to a cafe or, you know, set some time to, to read it every couple of weeks. And that's really great. Uh, you, you also get a new original poster insert in every, in every other issue, which is great as a, as a wall decoration to put on your window, to put on placards and take to protests. And they're, they're really great to keep. Yeah, the posters are really great. So make sure you become a Green Left supporter at greenleft.org.au slash support to help us out. Now let's hear what's happening around the world. Israel launched an airstrike on April 1 against the Iranian consulate in Damascus in Syria, killing more than 16 people, including Iranian military officials and civilians. This was not the first time that Israel has attacked other countries since October 7. It has also launched attacks on Lebanon, killing about 73 civilians, including children, and has also launched strikes on parts of Iraq and Syria. On April 13, Iran launched a counter-strike, with drones and missiles launched at military targets in Israel. Western leaders were quick to condemn Iran's attack after staying silent on Israel's clear breaches of international law and allowing the genocidal assault on Gaza to continue unabated for more than six months, with more than 35,000 Palestinians killed. Now, as we're recording, we've just heard that Israel has launched a strike, another strike against Iran, with explosions heard in the city of Isfahan, and Iran has grounded all its commercial flights. We don't have uh, much more detail at this point, so we'll report on that story uh, in next episode. But to be clear, any escalation in the war in the Middle East would be a disaster, but it is Israel and its Western imperialist allies, including Australia and the US, that is driving the conflict. Western imperialist countries need to end their intervention in the Middle East, and cut ties with genocidal apartheid Israel. Yeah, that's uh, terrifying stuff. And it, it is really telling that it took the death of an Australian citizen for the Australian government to make any condemnation of these deaths. It's also very telling that uh, any condemnation or action that the Australian government was willing to take was purely in the form of floating a so-called two-state solution rather than cutting any material ties which would impact Australia's and its military industrial complexes profits. Yeah, hundred percent. It's all it's all words and no meaningful action from the Labor government. Canada is another country that is deeply entwined with Israel's genocide, from shipments of military equipment to financial and political support. But one aspect that has not received enough attention is the recruitment of Canadians to fight in the IDF and the Canadian government's refusal to hold them accountable. We reported in November the Toronto police raid of the homes of activists who held a Palestine solidarity action at an Indigo bookstore. The owners of this chain, Heather Reisman and Gary Schwartz, established the HESEG Foundation, which provides scholarships for so-called lone soldiers who serve with the IDF. Writer Naomi Klein reported that Foundation provides all kinds of perks as a reward for military service with the IDF, putting HESEG in violation of Canada's Foreign Enlistment Act. 
which prohibits recruitment into the armed forces of a foreign state. But instead of holding Hesse accountable, the Canadian government has granted them tax-deductible status. They're rewarding them. But the recruitment of Canadians to the IDF goes well beyond Hesse. As of 2017, there were around 230 Canadians serving in the IDF. It is estimated that Israel recruits about 7,000 foreign youths to join the IDF every year. Israel's president, Reuven Rivlin, refers to them as true Zionists. There is now a campaign to hold Canadians serving the IDF as it commits genocide accountable. Yeah, and on the topic of IDF soldiers, we've had a great interview up on Green Left with uh, Nakshon Amir, who is a former IDF soldier and is now an anti-Zionist activist with Free Palestine Melbourne. He talks about his perspective being raised in Israel and indoctrinated into Zionist beliefs, his time serving in the, the, the IDF in the West Bank, and his journey to discarding Zionism and becoming an active supporter of Palestine. Okay, so I was born in Israel, as you know, as you mentioned, and I was raised like every child in Israel into the Zionism read a lot from historians, from real historians that show the real history, not the, not the, the propaganda history of or the myth of the Zionism. And I learned the truth. And I learned that that's Zionism and that's what happened with Palestine. And then I joined the, the Palestinian cause. That's a really interesting listen. You can check it out on the Green Left website or listen to it in the podcast feed. The International Freedom for Flotilla Coalition set sail this month to challenge the Israel blockade of Gaza. Hundreds of international human rights observers will take 5,500 tonnes of humanitarian aid to starving Palestinians. The FFC describes itself as a non-partisan international coalition of campaigns standing for freedom and human rights. Since 2010, it has sailed with the goal of breaking the blockade. The, uh, this emergency mission is being targeted is being organized as famine spreads in northern Gaza, and Palestinians throughout the Gaza Strip are severely deprived of necessities, a deliberate Israeli government policy. Northern River's Friends of Palestine activist, Surya McEwen, is participating in the flotilla from Australia. He wrote on his fundraising page that he's chosen to face the potential in danger involved in such a voyage for many reasons, including that 2.3 million human beings are being deliberately starved and many hundreds of thousands are injured and traumatised and desperate for med- medicine that's being deliberately denied them. Find out more at freedomflotilla.org. Following the overturning of Roe v. Wade, Republican-controlled states in the U.S. are trying to enact bans and restrictions on abortion rights. In Arizona, the Supreme Court banned all abortions except to save a woman's life on April 10. But now, abortion rights activists in the state are collecting more than a million signatures to hold a referendum to enshrine abortion rights in the state's constitution. If successful, the referendum will be held during the November election. And previous referendums to enshrine abortion rights have been victorious, even in states with ultra-right-wing legislatures. One of these was in the Republican-controlled state of Ohio on November 7 last year, and in Kansas, an anti-abortion referendum was defeated by high voter turnout uh, thanks to the mobilization of abortion rights groups. They also defeated anti-abortion referenda in Montana and Kentucky. Now, the abortion rights forces need to build the kind of mass street action which led to Roe v. Wade and won the fight for abortion rights in the first place. But unfortunately, a lot of the anger is being directed towards re-electing the Democrats in the upcoming elections. Also in the US, a spate of airline safety incidents have taken place, with United Airlines Alaska and Southwest Airlines all having major incidents. The most widely reported was on January 5th when a panel of a new... Alaska Airlines 737 MAX 9 jet blew off midair. So far, the incidents have involved Boeing aircraft assembled in unionized factory in Washington state and non-union factories in South Carolina, with subcontractors making many of the parts. 
Overall, unions represent only 35% of the industry's 163,000 employees. Boeing workers understand that the safety issues are the direct result of management and quality control failures as executives rush to build aircraft to increase profits. Industry executives have been forced to admit their mistakes, with Boeing CFO Brian West telling an investor conference that, for years, we prioritised the movement of the airplane through the factory over getting it done right. After the Alaska airline incident, Boeing leadership was shaken up and changed, but workers' representatives were not brought to the table. There have been many lower level whistleblowers over the years that have reported dangerous systems in place in aircraft construction, such as mechanics being allowed to sign off on their own work. Workers and unions need a place at the decision-making table to ensure the best outcomes for safety and for workers who assemble, maintain and fix the planes. Another huge safety failure was the collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore in Maryland after it was hit by a container ship on March 26, killing six maintenance workers. The ship lost all power and collided with one of the bridge's supports at 15 kilometers an hour, and the entire bridge span then collapsed within seconds. A video of the shocking incident went viral, and it's a it's pretty crazy video, so definitely check it out. The maintenance workers were part of a non-unionized paving crew who were repairing potholes on the bridge. Uh, And a 2023 American Road and Transportation Building Association report said that one in three bridges across the country need repair or replacement. The disaster also highlights the dangers of not having ships escorted to the open sea by tugboats. And the collision clearly indicates that more precautions should have been taken by an industry known for cutting corners to maximise profits. After Turkey's disappointing general and presidential elections in May, which saw Recep Tayyip Erdogan's Justice and Development Party, or AKP, consolidate control, hopes were low for the March 31 local elections. However, the results show that the secular Republican People Party had pushed the AKP into second place. Commentators were quick to hail this as evidence of Turkish democracy, with even Erdogan declaring the victor of this election is democracy. But it wasn't long before the democratic veneer became unstuck. The first example of this was in the city of Van, where pro-Kurdish leftist People's Equality and Democracy Party candidate Abdullah Zaydan received 55% of the vote, almost double the 27% received by AKP runner-up. Despite this, the Van Provincial Electoral Board decided to award the mayorality to the AKP candidate instead. This is a repeat of the 2019 local elections, where six Kurdish mayors were replaced, then 48 of the remaining 59 HDP mayors were later removed and replaced by government stooges. 97 of 102 HDP mayors elected in 2014 were removed, with threats of prison and exile. But this time, Hundreds of thousands took to the street in support of Sadan, not just in Van. Protesters, include, including children, were met by high-pressure water hoses, gas, rubber bullets at close range, and beatings, but were not deterred. Authorities realised they had misjudged the extent of the anger their dismissal of democracy would provoke and overturned the decision, formally electing Zaydan. This is just one story of corruption and anti-democratic manoeuvring by the ruling AKP, which also included burning ballot boxes and transporting government supporting voters to secure key areas. There are still many challenges for Kurdish and left forces in Turkey. As Sarah Glynn wrote in Green Left, every Kurdish achievement is followed by further struggle. Another recent election was in Senegal, where Basuru Diome Feya from the Patriots of Senegal Party, or PASDEF, was sworn in as president on April 2, after his historic election win on March 24. Fayal won more than 54% of the vote in the first round, beating rival Amadou Ba from the outgoing president Macky Sall's ruling alliance for the Republic Coalition. Sall had ruled Senegal since 2012, and the election took place against the backdrop of a political crisis that has escalated dramatically since 2021, with bouts of protests met with severe state repression and violence. Saal's attempt to remain in power beyond the two-term limit, coupled with the use of state power to target opposition parties, generated mass anger, which exploded around the arrest of PASTEF founder Sonko in March 2021. Sonko and PASTEF drew huge support among Senghalese youth for addressing issues of unemployment and poverty, 
And Sonko's 2021 arrest uh, triggered five days of massive protests in which 14 people were killed by government forces. And then his sentencing in June 2023 triggered another round of unrest with at least 14 killed. Pastef announced in November last year that Faya, the party's general secretary, would run as a candidate. And Saul attempted to de- delay the elections, but the plan was thwarted by mass mobilization. Faya and Sonko were finally released from prison in March 14, which is 10 days before the election, in an attempt to appease the people. Now, the incoming Pastef government faces huge challenges, including uh, food security, high levels of debt, and extreme poverty. But Faya and Pastef have promised a break from the past and to negotiate mining and energy contracts to boost the Senegalese economy. And they have a plan to break away from the neo-colonial CFA franc currency and establish a new national currency. Less than a month after former South Korean Defence Minister Lee yong sup was appointed as ambassador to Australia, he was forced to resign on March 29th after protests in South Korea and Australia. Lee was under investigation for allegedly tampering with an investigation into the death of a soldier when the South Korean government circumvented a constitutional law banning him from leaving the country to send him to Australia. The Korean community in Australia organised protests against this undemocratic manoeuvre. South Korean President Yoon suk Yeol said Lee's appointment was to boost military cooperation and arms sales between the two countries. Arms industry publication Asia Pacific Defence Reporter welcomed the appointment because Lee's career had been characterised by a close working relationship with the US. The appointment represents the growing arms race and military cooperation in the Asia Pacific region, which seeks to defend US hegemony, particularly in an effort to militarily contain China's economic growth. The campaign to free Russian socialist and anti-war dissident Boris Kagalitsky continues, with many people signing the petition at freeboris.info. Boris has recently been transferred from the pre-trial detention centre to a penal colony in an unknown location, which makes it even more urgent to free him. And we've been posting Boris's letters from prison on the Green Left website, and we'll continue to post regular updates about the campaign. You can read more about all the stories we talked about today, plus videos, detailed analysis, and book and music reviews and more stories at greenleft.org.au. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please consider becoming a Green Left supporter today from $5 a month and donate to our fighting fund to help us continue reporting on workers, climate, and social justice movements. Go to greenleft.org.au slash support to help us out. We really appreciate your support, especially in light of the censorship we've been facing as we talked about earlier. 100% and uh, thanks to Sean Valenzuela for all the music that you heard in this podcast. You can find his work by going to at Little Archer Beats or clicking the link in the podcast description. And remember to follow Green Left at Green Left Online on social media for the latest news and analysis. Thanks for listening.